Greetings in the precious name of Jesus. I welcome you again to our Revelation series in which today in this segment we are going to talk about the fourth church in Revelation chapter 2 namely the church in Theatira. And I have called this church in my book the blurred church of Theatira. We have seen the busy church of Ephesus and then we saw the brilliant church in Smyrna and in our foregone session, a long one by the way, we discussed a lot of details pertaining to the beastly church of Pergamum or Pergamos and today we are going to talk about the blurred church of Theatira thereby coming to the end of chapter 2. And in our next segment, we will be going to chapter 3. Let me read the <coughs> message to the church in Theatira, found in chapter 2, verses 18, all the way down to verse 29. And unto the angel of the church in Theatira write, These things said the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Theatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but unto you, <clears throat> none other bird, burden but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. My dear friends, we do have a little chart with which we are studying the seven churches. And if you are a follower of this program as uh, somebody who would really want to know the meaning of the book of Revelation, then you would have already made a chart. If so, in that chart, the first column should be the name of the church in which you would write Theatira. And the second column is the description of Jesus, the giver of the message, the speaker, how he appears. It says in verse 18, and unto the angel of the church Theatira write, and if you are joining us for the first time, my dear friends, we have already discussed in length what the angel means there. The angel is not a celestial being in Revelation 2, but the shepherd of the particular church receiving the message of Jesus. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Three descriptions of Jesus. Here, Jesus is described as the Son of God. Why? <clears throat> I'll explain. My dear friends, we will not be able to explain Trinity. We will never understand Trinity. No example attempted by various scholars 
could do justice in explicating or elucidating, elucidating the Trinity. It's so complex, it's so divine, our finite minds cannot comprehend it. We just have to leave it at that. <coughs> Only believe that our God is one God who is in three persons. Now I have an explanation of my own. I developed it in trying to explain this to uh, people who come and say, uh, please give us some sort of explanation as to why Jesus is called the Son of God and why the Father is called the Father because it confuses us so much. So the explanation that I'm going to give you today is not the explanation of Trinity because nobody can do that. But let me, uh, let me, let me just try to explain something. You know, God is one, okay, God is one in three persons. Now when God created man, he created out of love, he created with all the good things uh, of man and the world, but then the man committed sin by disobeying <coughs> God's command. Let's not go into that in detail. Because in my regular sermons, I have explained what happened when, uh, uh, when Eve saw the tree and uh, she ate of it. Now, I have planned, in fact, I have done actually three programs already in English. And there are going to be many, 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 many programs. And the program is called uh, What truly happened okay now you may already know that i have a program called ask the pastor where a lot of questions of the people are uh, addressed and dealt with and then now i have the revelation series and then i have a lot of sermons and uh, teachings that i have posted on youtube and one of the other programs that is going to be aired quite soon is called what truly happened what truly happened when God created man in his own image and likeness? What truly happened when Eve saw the uh, tree and fell by eating the fruit? What truly happened when Cain uh, murdered Abel? <coughs> so, throughout the Bible I would be having uh, uh, a program dealing with what truly happened. In that I am explaining why uh, they fell. Okay, uh, Let's not delve into that now. Nonetheless, they fell, okay? And God had to send them to hell. Now, why? Because God is a righteous God. He is uh, the God of justice. And God's righteousness, okay, demands that man be cast into the lake of fire because of sin. But the same righteous God is a gracious God. And God's grace says, oh, how can I send my creation, the man who I created after my image and likeness uh, to hell. So the, the discussion between God's righteousness and God's grace. God's righteousness says, no, the man must end up in hell. And God's grace says, uh, how can I save him from hell? And then the righteous says, the only way man could be saved is by paying the wage, which is death. The wages of sin is death. And then the grace of God says, okay, righteousness, can I become that man who could die for all humankind, thereby paving the, the, paving the way for them to be able to come to us? And righteousness says, okay. And there is this contract between the righteousness of God and the grace of God. Righteousness is sending grace down to earth to be born as a human and then pay the penalty for all sins of mankind by shedding every drop of blood that this grace is going to have in his body when he uh, is born as a man. And then <coughs> righteousness could say, okay people, now if you come through grace, then I can accept you into heaven. Because grace has now paid your price and you are able to obtain uh, forgiveness from grace and be saved. And this contract between the righteousness of God and the grace of God is uh, expedi expedited, witnessed and executed by the holiness of God, okay, the Holy Spirit. So the righteousness and the grace have a contract now. 
grace is going to go down to earth as a man, be born and then die and pay the penalty to the grace of God and the witness and the executor of the entire enterprise would be the holiness of God. And that is why the Bible says that, that uh, God became man through the Holy Spirit. Mary conceived through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled the grace of God to be born through Mary as man Jesus. And when, when the grace of God was down on earth, although in reality the righteousness of God and the grace of God are but one, neither of uh, uh, them would be higher or lower than the other. Uh, when the grace of God came as hu a human, obviously the grace of God came to fulfill the demand of the righteousness of God, thereby becoming smaller than the righteousness of God. And the big one of the two at that point was called the father and the small one as the son. There was no biological father-son relationship between uh, God and Jesus, but uh, the righteousness of God and the grace of God. Okay, And that's why the grace of God, Jesus, all the time said, I have to do the will of my father. I have to perform the duties that are stipulated to me by the righteousness of God. When he went to be baptized by John in the river Jordan, John says in Matthew chapter 3, uh, the last few verses, look, you need to baptize me. How can I baptize you? And then Jesus says, let, let, let me pass. Let, let me be baptized. By this, we fulfill the requirements of the righteousness. Jesus is hinting that. Okay. And Jesus was born through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was always there. And the same Holy Spirit descends on Jesus when Jesus came out of the water in Jordan after baptism. And that is why at times Jesus said, well, my father is greater than I. Because the righteousness of God at that point was greater than the grace of God. But then when people said, when the disciples said, show us the father, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the father because my father and I are one. Of course, the grace of God and the righteousness of, of, of God are one. It's the same God, right? No, no two gods. We don't believe in two or three gods. Christians have only one God, okay? That one God became man, but that man died on the cross and not the one who did not come. The Father did not die on the cross. The Holy Spirit did not die on the cross. But Jesus did, the Son of God, okay? How? We don't understand. We don't comprehend. We can't fathom it. Just leave it at that, okay? And at this point, to the church in Theatira, Jesus is talking as the one who enabled them to uh, become the, the, the sons of God. And that's why the Bible says in Pauline theology in Ephesians, Paul very clearly says, by grace you were saved through faith. On God's part, God granted grace. On our part, we offered faith. By grace, through faith, you were saved. That's salvation. Okay? And the church in Theatira got saved through this immense sacrifice of Jesus, the grace of God. Okay? And he is now appearing as the Son of God, uh, as he who took upon himself all the pain for these people. But what they have done is very painful because... In his condemnation, he is explaining that and wait till we come to that, uh, that uh, section in a minute. Now as the son of God, he is very angry when he talks to the church in Theatira. Why? Look it says, Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. We discussed in chapter 1 that the eyes of Jesus were like flaming fire because of the anger he had over the churches. He is not angry of the sin of the world. When he, look at, when he looks at the world and the sin thereof, he is compassionate. He is sad. But when he looks at the church that he, he had bought with that price, and if they mess with the truth, and if they aggravate Jesus, then Jesus would be very angry with the church. And we are seeing the Son of God, an angry person when he talks to the church in Theatira. And also his feet are like fine brass. And I explained when we talked about uh, this in chapter 1 
that fine brass denotes judgment. Jesus was not only angry with the church, he was there to execute the judgment. He was very ferocious. He was there ready to kick the church. Why? The brass was on his feet, not the hands. And I explained when we talked about that in chapter 1, that if he had brass on his arms, then it would smite and then embrace. But when it's on the feet, the embrace part is impossible because you cannot embrace with your feet. So we see Jesus as very, very angry when he talks to the church in Theatera. Nonetheless, nonetheless, he fails not to appreciate them for what they have, what, what the good things they have. Now that's our Lord, even though he's upset with us sometimes when we fall, when we err, uh, when we commit uh, sins, he may be upset with us, but he is not somebody who overlooks the good things that we have. He is an appreciating God. And look, uh, he is uh, saying, the next column would be the uh, commendation. And in the, <coughs> in the commendation he says, I know thy works, okay, you are a working church, the charity, you are very gracious to people, you, you support people, and uh, the church in Theatira was actually not a poor church, because, uh, hey, you know what? Theatira was also a little town in uh, uh, Asia Minor, but it was not, uh, not a hyper-rich place, but not a poor place either. Because they, the water in Theatira was very good and they used it for dyeing clothes with purple, you know, linen and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you read uh, Acts chapter 16 and then, then chapter 19, uh, you would read that Paul went to this part of Asia Minor and when he preached, especially in Ephesus, okay, there was this girl called Lydia who came from Theatira. She was the first convert of Paul in Ephesus. Okay, And uh, the Bible says that she was uh, a woman who worked with uh, clothes. She was a dyeing dy dyer. Or she was applying dye to these uh, garments and she was a uh, person who sold those. And uh, Theatira is that. Quite possibly Paul went to Theatira, but we don't have any historical records for that. But uh, he was so near Theatira, by the way. It's not too far from Ephesus, and Paul was there in Ephesus. <coughs> Everybody's business was uh, producing dye and linen, you know, they dye the linen. People from outside uh, Theatira also brought their clothes to get it dyed with purple. And that was a good business. And unlike uh, in the Smyrna church, where the produ production of myrrh involved religious uh, elements, so when they became Christians, they had to stop uh, manufacturing uh, myrrh. In Theatira, uh, the people who were working with uh, dye, uh, purple, uh, with linen, need not give their enterprise up when they became Christians. So the Christian church in Theatira was not a poor church. So they were involved in uh, a great deal of charity. They not only supported uh, poor people within Theatira, for they had uh, uh, quite a few, and even now, even today, we have about 20,000 people live in that little vicinity. A uh, large part of them are Greeks. Uh, there are some Jews also, uh, but as we know that it's in uh, Turkey and it's largely a Muslim place. And uh, then too, they, they extended their help, their charitable support to the neighboring villages, to poor people. So that was there. The church was a, a generous church. So Jesus is not all that against the social gospel. But he would be not happy if the church only has social gospel. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> they were into some uh, uh, social work. And their patience. They were a good sort of people, okay, patient people. Uh, but then if we start reading about uh, their condemnation, their very patience, the good virtue plays against them because they were too tolerant to evil. Anyway, it says, and thy work and the last to be more than the first. Okay. Uh, now, the, that, that, that is uh, sometimes... Uh, <clears throat> 
uh, misunderstood, but they kept on increasing their work, you know. They, they kept on increasing their work. And uh, they were a, they were a very um, happy people. They, they were having a lot of work programs and uh, they were a good sort of a uh, working church. But the reason why Jesus was very angry was very meaningful. He was rightfully angry because of their uh, deeds. I'll explain. Let's go to the next column, condemnation. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Although they were few things, okay? Many good things and a few bad things, but the, fa- ba- the few bad things were very bad things. That's why Jesus was so angry with the church. And when we talk about the historical dates, I'll explain, You will it'll b- blow your socks off your feet. Okay, (coughs) I have caught a cold uh, between the last segment and now that's why I'm suffering when I'm talking to you. Okay, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou suffered that woman Jezebel, okay, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit uh, fornication and to eat things sacrificed uh, unto idols. Jezebel, a huge topic, a huge topic. My dear friends, uh, back in 2006, I held a a, a conference in Perth, Scotland, in the United Kingdom. And uh, in a place called the Salutation Hotel, the world's oldest hotel. And uh, it was a three days conference. Many good things uh, sprung up uh, from that conference. And uh, that was about the spirit of Jezebel. People call me a Jezebel expert. Why? Because you remember the woman Jezebel, okay? Who is introduced to us in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings as the daughter of the Sidonian king Etbal and uh, Ahab, the son of Omri, who was actually the king of Israel, the divided nation, the the divided northern kingdom of Israel, married uh, Jezebel, and Jezebel came back with the Baal cult, Baal cult, or Baal, as some uh, would call it. And uh, she brought 400 prophets of Baal, 450 by the way, and 400 prophets of Ashtaroth, the Babylonian goddess. And uh, she massacred God's prophet in their thousands. And if you read 1 Kings chapter 11, 17, by the way, you would see that a man called Obadiah, who at the time of uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, a very timid prophet, he, he, he did not show that he was a prophet, but he was very um, good with the king, and he was able to protect 100 prophets and put them in two caves, 50 in each, and give them uh, food, bread and water, and uh, he protected them from the hands of Jezebel, okay? And Jezebel was a prophet slainer. Jezebel brought idolatry back into Israel to the extent where God just stopped it to rain for three and a half years. The greatest punishment one could ever endure. If fire falls, they'll die. If uh, flood comes, they'll die. If uh, any other catastrophe strikes, they will die. But if for three and a half years there is no rain or dew, people will just, uh, they will be alive, but uh, they will be suffering without water. I mean, very unhygienic, very hot. And that was the judgment God passed on the nation of Israel because uh, of Jezebel, okay? And Ahab, of course, allowed Jezebel to come and run the whole show. I have, my dear friends, the the videos of the three-day conference that I uh, conducted in Perth, Scotland in 2006. It's on YouTube under the title Jezebel 1, 2 and 3. And I would very much encourage you to please study that because not just for revelation, but uh, for a lot of things. Now we, we I, I have, okay, now, now there are three 
main subjects that I would want you to follow, which I cannot teach here because they are so long and huge. I have a huge teaching of Elijah the prophet. Okay, Who was Elijah? What was his role in coming and confronting Jezebel? What was his role in bringing Israel back to God? And how he brought fire on Mount Carmel. Okay, and uh, my Tamil and Singhala uh, teachings on Elijah are aired on through so many television channels throughout the world. And literally hundreds of thousands of people have been blessed. They, they, they constantly call us, they write to us. And uh, it's in English too. <coughs> and I, I, I believe you would be blessed. So that's the teaching on Elijah. Okay, and then the, the one that I'm talking about, Jezebel 1, 2 and 3. Now the video quality is not very impressive because we, we used a simple handheld camcorder and uh, the three days seminar was really uh, very, very powerful, very anointed. In that hotel, uh, Salutation Hotel, we did it in a conference hall and people could not stay. People, I don't know why, people started check, checking out and and they said there's something happening in the conference. We, we cannot uh, be here peacefully. And the management approached us. And uh, David Griffiths was my sponsor. He was the one who arranged the conference. And the management came and said, well, what are you guys doing in uh, that conference hall? Because many people are checking out. They don't want to stay in the hotel. Stop whatever you're doing. I said, no, no, no. We are having a very big, big um, thing there. And the Lord impressed upon my heart. Uh, to go to Inverness, which is which was just a couple of hours away from Perth, and uh, do a prayer walk around the Loch Ness. You, you have you heard about uh, the Loch Ness monster and stuff? That lake, Loch in the uh, Scottish language means lake, and we drove all around it uh, and we prayed, and then we went to a place called the Boleskine House, the capital of world witchcraft, which is there. Which, which is in the jungle, uh, slightly away, about three and a half miles from uh, the Loch Ness. And also J.K. Rowling comes from there. Remember the, the writer of Harry Potter? She's from in Venice. So we did a lot of spiritual warfare in, uh, in Venice uh, around the Loch Ness. And of course the, the three days seminar on Jezebel in uh, uh, Scotland. And those tapes uh, were made, uh, CDs were sent to many churches and the many churches reported us back saying a great revival transpired in their churches. So my dear friends, uh, please uh, do ignore the poor quality of video and sound but then go and uh, uh, listen to it. Many people say, Suresh, why don't you do that in a proper camera uh, like the ones that we, we are using now? Uh, to produce Jezebel. I can't do that my dear friends but that anointing that I had in 2006 for that conference was so immense I don't think uh, if I redo it uh, I would match that anointing that I had at that point and therefore I said no I'll, I'll, I'll do other teachings and I would really encourage you to listen to that. Now <coughs> if, you are, if you watch Jezebel then you need to watch Babylon also. There's a teaching on Babylon that I have done again on YouTube uh, with much picture and uh, sound quality. Please watch that. In that I'm explaining how the first king in the world called Gilgamesh who is known as Nimrod in our Bible uh, becomes the first king of the world and he was instrumental in building the, the, the tower of Babel. Babel means the gate to God, the false gate, you know, the real gate. I am the door, said Jesus. And uh, this Babel was the false kind of uh, gate. And uh, they built uh, that uh, huge uh, tower only to uh, face uh, destruction by scattering of their tongues. God just scattered their tongues, tongue, confused their tongues. And from there they left. But, but, wait a minute. When they, f they when they started speaking, different languages and then they, they moved away from each other. Some went to the Nile region uh, and creating the Nile uh, region uh, civilization. And then some went to the north uh, to Europe where they formed the, the Rhine uh, uh, civilization. And then further on they moved to Scandinavia and uh, there was the 
the other group of people and then some went to Mohenjo-dar or Harappa in the Sindhu Valley uh, civilization and uh, everybody fled, spread from Babel. Okay? When they went, they took the ideologies of uh, Babylon, uh, the political Babylon, the religious Babylon and uh, the, uh, the uh, economical, commercial Babylon. And from then to now, every politics, the political world and the religious world, it, does, it doesn't have, it can be any religion and the economical world are all controlled by these three Babylons in a very abstract way, okay, but in a very forceful way. Uh, until all three Babylons will be destroyed in Revelation 17 and 18, okay. That is why these three Babylons will have three leaders and those three leaders are the three antichrists we, we, we will confront in the book of Revelation. Okay, the, the antichrist himself, the chieftain of all, will be the political figure and uh, his second, the religious antichrist would be the prophet. Okay, and the third stooge would be, the third antichrist would be the commercial uh, Antichrist, the beast, okay, and uh, therefore starting from Genesis 11 all the way to Revelation 18, we would uh, see the start and the finish of Babylon. And for you to know how the spirit of Babylon is so powerful today, both in the world and in the church, you need to watch my teaching on Babylon. And for you to understand how the spirit of Jezebel has been very active, not only in the world, but also in the church. Uh, you will have to watch my program, my teaching on Jezebel. Now the word Jezebel, I, I'm not just talking about the woman who we, uh, we we see in 1 Kings 17. I am proving in that that the spirit of Jezebel is one of the three main spirits, the, the chieftains of evil spirits. Okay, the, the, the Satan has formed a false trinity called the, the Jezebel, the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of death and hell. And in that I am teaching how Jezebel has always been involved long before the woman Jezebel comes into the scene. But uh, I am explaining the meaning of Jezebel in the Hebrew language, okay, where she came and uh, started killing the prophets and destroying the nation of Israel by uh, making them go st astray from God. And then the Sidonian language where she really came from, Sidon, and then the, the Babylonian meaning, okay, and the Canaanite meaning, the four meanings of the name itself speak volume, volumes about the spirit of Jezebel. And I'm explicating all that, okay. When Jesus is talking about Jezebel here, <coughs> Many people believe that uh, that uh, the church in Theatira would have permitted a woman, uh, a, a self-appointed prophetess of which Jesus was now talking against. No, my dear friends, now don't ever mistake Jezebel to be a woman. Of course, Ahab's wife was a woman and she was a very instrumental person. She was an instrument used by, used by that spirit. But the spirit of Jezebel is not a woman, it's, a, it's an asexual spirit, it's one of the chief spirits, right? It's the topmost, <coughs> topmost uh, satanic spirit, okay? Uh, I will explain, I, I will explain what happened to the church in Theatira. Look at, look at this. I have a few things against thee, because thou suffered that woman Jezebel, <coughs> which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Prophets and prophecy. Here's another thing. If you want to know more about prophets and prophecy, I, 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 I can see what you're thinking. Okay. Uh oh, there he goes. He is going to talk about another teaching of his. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My dear friends, <clears throat> I have another teaching called Prophets and Prophecy. In that, 
I'm talking about uh, the prophet and the prophets. Grammatical, I have said that in this Revelation series once before, but it's appropriate to repeat it here. We know that grammatically, prophets is the plural of prophet. But theologically, prophet is totally different to prophets. On the same token, grammatically, prophecies is the plural to prophecy. But theologically, prophecy is different to prophecies. And I have a teaching where I'm explaining these four things. What is a prophet? What is a prophet's? What is prophecy? And what is prophecies? Now don't think that I'm, I'm making a grammatical error because using is for prophecies. Uh, I know what I'm talking about. And if you watch my program on that, you will then know, okay, okay this guy sounded grammatically wrong, but then it was not uh, wrong after all. Okay, now, here in this context, she calleth herself a prophetess. To call somebody a prophet or a prophetess is very serious, my dear friends. Do you know why many people call themselves prophets? Because they have the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of the word of wisdom. Uh, some people have the gift of knowledge when they come to your church, when they preach, they would say, there is somebody who is having this ailment and uh, then ob obviously there would be somebody with that ailment. The word of knowledge is one of the gifts of the spirit. A lot of people are blessed with that gift. Especially God gives this gift to many evangelists. So there are some great evangelists who can, while preaching, call people by their names and uh, perform miracles. These are wonderful gifts that the Lord has given. I am not at all against them. But some people dare to call themselves prophets because of the gifts of words of word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. And uh, we got to be very careful. Yes, the, the office of the prophet is also one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and it's there in the church. I'm not saying that there are no prophets today. Nope, I'm not that kind of a person. I am not a person who says that the functioning of the Holy Spirit, speaking of tongues, speaking in tongues and uh, using the uh, gifts of the Spirit are all uh, confined to the first century. They don't exist now. No, 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 I don't say that. They are well <clears throat> available today. Okay, but you must be very careful before ordaining somebody as a prophet. Okay. Now there are so many self-claimed prophets and prophetesses. They, because of certain gifts they have and the attractive manner in which they can ex exercise the gifts, they attract a lot of people. And because of that, they start to call themselves prophets and prophetesses. And sometimes when that happens, they are treated like soothsayers. Even in Bible, Bible days, many of the genuine prophets were approached by people uh, as if they were coming to a soothsayer. Okay? And today so many prophets are like that. There are people who bring offerings and uh, ask these people to tell them who to marry, what business to start, what to do. And I'll tell you, I have seen event after event after event where these prophets have felt obliged to say something to these people because they have come in expectation and they just say something that they feel and these people take their word as the word of God and they have gone and done and caught got caught in a humongous trouble. I have seen that. People losing jobs, homes, uh, bro families broken and even, even many prophets have prophesied to people saying, God is going to heal you and taking those words, these people then stop uh, uh, taking medications and stop looking after them because this prophet has told you are going to be healed and then uh, they die in vain. 
So uh, the office of the prophet is a very sensitive one, very dangerous one. And there are genuine prophets out there. Perhaps one of you may be uh, a genuine prophet. Hey, if the Lord doesn't say certain things, don't feel obliged to tell the people that God says something. Just tell them the truth. Just tell them, well, you have come uh, expecting something uh, from me to tell you from God, but I don't think God is uh, talking to me. So please uh, go and read your Bible. Let the Lord talk to you in some way. Right? Okay, they may not come to you again. They may just go thinking, go away thinking that, uh, well, he is not a good prophet. Who cares, my dear friends? How many people tell me that I am a false teacher? How many people tell me that I am not a good guy? It doesn't matter, my dear friends. What you have by way of a gift should be exercised in a very true manner. You need to exercise a lot of integrity and you've got to be very careful. But this woman Jezebel is not just a woman here. The whole church in Theatira was very much into prophecy. Mm, I did this uh, historical, uh, uh, historical excavation. And the church in Theatira, everybody was a prophet. Everybody wanted to become a prophet. So, so, so they would, there, 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 there was a group of people who would just get up and say, utter a prophecy every day. Sometimes, my dear friends, some prophecies are not at all prophecies. They are just true statements. You know, somebody would get up and, oh, God, God says <coughs> that he loves you. You don't need a prophet to come and say that. God's love is there. Your God loves you. Anybody can say that. Okay? A prophecy must be very specific, in line with the Bible. And there were so many prophecies in Theatira which contradict, contradicted the word of God. Now, the prophets, uh, the prophecies were so uh, anti-biblical that... Uh, the prophecies themselves led people to spiritual and other fornication. Look, that's what it says. Which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. What is spiritual fornication? To go after other gods. My dear friends, a lot of prophets even to date do the work of the prophet like the way some other religious gurus and uh, uh, leaders do. A lot of similarities are seen, especially in our part of the world and in Africa. Right? When I say our part of the world, Asia, I mean India and in Sri Lanka. There are some prophets who when they talk and when they uh, perform, they, they just look like uh, some guru, some swami, some religious leader who does uh, these heathen practices. There are some television channels segregated to prophecy. Okay. And when I watch some of those channels, I am so saddened by the way in which they just demonstrate these heathen things. You got to be very careful. Christianity is pure. Christianity is smart. Christianity is decent. Prophecy is there. Prophets are there, but we must be very, very careful about following the biblical precepts in prophets and prophecies. And they were com committing uh, spiritual fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. You know, <coughs> idol, that's a metaphorical way in which uh, uh, they say condoning the things that are idolatrous. Even today that's happening, my dear friends. Some of the churches are allowing things to be performed the way they are performed outside in other religions. Now we know that in Sri Lanka and in India, uh, many people have come to the Lord from being Buddhists and Hindus. And those religions are very rich in rituals and perform perform uh, performations. Okay? They have a lot of this and that and uh, auspicious uh, times and days. And uh, they have a religious methodology uh, implementing in uh, business, in building, marriage, uh, matchmaking, etc., etc. And how many Christians have downloaded those things onto their, into their Christianity and they are renaming it with Christian phrases, but inside you get the other religious ideas. 
Our culture is from the Bible, my dear friends. Of course, we, we, we need to take on board the cultural values uh, as long as they don't contradict uh, with the Bible. But these prophets, many of them, they have just uh, taken on board all this religious garbage from other religions and put them in bottles and labeled them with, with Christian labels. I tell them, I tell them something like this, you know, when people ask me questions in my program, Ask the Pastor, in Ask the Pastor in Singhala and Tamil, we deal with a lot of these issues, which I don't uh, deal with the English people because uh, they, they, they're not that much relevant to the English speaking people. And uh, I'm asked, I'm asked, okay, Pastor, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? And uh, sometimes I can be uh, cynical and sarcastic. I tell them, okay, if you want to commit a murder, if you, if you tie the person who you're, you're going to murder and you get the weapon and then you start it by prayer and you say, oh Lord, loving Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help me to murder this person perfectly and uh, may I perform the murder like a professional. Lord, I pray that you would be with me as I murder this guy and let him die uh, a painful death so that I'm pleased, Lord. Thank you for granting this opportunity of killing this person. In Jesus' name, Amen. And then you kill the person and then after slaughtering the person, you say, thank you, Lord, for being with me. Uh, you, 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 you energized me, you helped me, you were there with me when I committed the murder. Uh, and then I ask them, uh, if somebody commits a murder like that, are you going to accept it? And that's the same that these people are doing. With a lot of religious garbage they take from these other religions. Or they start it with a prayer and they, they, they perform it with Christian phraseology instead of the other religious phraseology. And then, if it, then they, they, they finish it with prayer. And people are so impressed because they don't see anything new about it. I mean, they are so accustomed to these things. And they are very excited. They are very ecstatic. They are very happy. And uh, many of these uh, prophets have become men pleasers than God pleases. And there is a command in the Bible where Jesus says, Be not men pleasers. But these prophets are pleasing men. These TV channels are, are pleasing men. And many of them have now taken upon themselves the responsibility, quote and unquote, of uh, teaching eschatology, things pertaining to the last days. And boy, the crap they are giving to people. Intolerable for a person like me. Intolerable. But they garnish it with so you know beautiful Christian phraseology and Christian elements. And they make uh, the hearers... Uh, so so happy that's what God is very Jesus was very upset with this church right now verse 21 look at this and I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not and this tells us that he was not talking about the woman Jezebel in first Kings chapter 17 because God never was able to give her any chance of repentance because she was not uh, listening to any prophet because she was just killing prophets. And this is talking about the local prophets who are synonymous to that, that woman Jezebel. Okay, Local prophets of Theatira and today we have uh, them in our churches too. Uh, <clears throat> okay, verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. The, the expression bed was a bed of pain. So Jesus is talking about uh, judgment. I will judge her. Okay, she'll be judged, and 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 those who commit adultery with her also will go into the great tribulation. My dear friends, here Jesus is not only talking about the prophets of the day, but he was also talking about uh, the false prophets that are going to come after the time of the rapture. He's just giving a glimpse of what's going to happen in Revelation 17 and 18 here. And if you wait till we come to that, okay, then you will know how Jesus is going to judge the spirit of Jezebel and uh, those who were with her. Okay, except they repent of their deeds, my dear friends. That's, that's the kindness of Jesus, the graciousness of Jesus. Albeit his so angry, albeit his ferocious anger against what's happening in the church, our God is a gracious God, and uh, our God is a God of second chances. He gives us second, not only second, third, fourth, multiple chances. 
Remember when Peter asked, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? No, 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 seven times, 70. Unlimited. So Jesus himself is demonstrating. He says, okay, I will do this, except uh, they rep repent. But if they don't repent, look at verse 23. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> he's saying, now this we can see throughout the history of the church. Remember I told you the seven eras, the seven dispensations of the church. And uh, we are in the fourth dispensation. And uh, the years are going to be from 609 uh, uh, AD to 1520 AD and I'm going to tell you what happened in those years decades centuries by the way and uh, Jesus was talking about that now so here we see that in these uh, little verses Jesus was talking about the problem in Theatira in that local church and then he gives a glimpse about what's going to happen in Revelation 17 and 18 and here by talking about the children with death etc is talking about the Theatira church era. Lovely, isn't it? Do you see that I told you, remember when I explained about the seven churches, I said the seven churches primarily mean the seven literal churches which were there in Asia Minor. The secondary meaning the seven dispensations okay, of the church era starting from the church to the time of the church's rapture. And thirdly I said the seven churches are all the churches in the world. Yours, mine, everything. And uh, Jesus is very beautifully putting it here in talking about the middle church here because this is the fourth church. Three before that and three after that. And right in the middle in the, to the church of Theatira, he's, when he talks about Jezebel, he's saying, I'm going to deal with the spirit of Jezebel now, the people in Theatira, and also eventually in Revelation 17 and 18, okay, in the future, and then throughout the church history by dealing with her children. In other words, the, the churches that spring up after each generation in the, this epoch that I told you between 609 AD and 1520 AD. Beautiful, isn't it? Right? Now, verse 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Theatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Okay, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. When Jesus is talking about what you have already hold fast until I come, he's talking about the word. You hold on to the word. Because we are talking about a church that was very much into prophecy. And the problem, the danger with prophecy is the prophecy has the tendency to leak away, move away, sway away from the word. That is why my dear friends, if you want to know if some prophecy that you hear is a good prophecy, you need to weigh it against the Bible. Is it biblical? For example, if a prophet comes and says, I went to heaven, I saw David playing the guitar and uh, Moses came and offered me a cup of tea. Look at the Bible. Does the Bible talk about those things? Is it biblical for somebody to go to heaven and come? Because the Bible says, no one has gone, gone to heaven. Okay. Uh, you know, a Tamil, uh, there's a there's a channel called Angel TV in Tamil. You know, one, one day the guy, he's saying, the, the, the proprietor of the Angel TV, he says something like this. It's on YouTube, my dear friends, in Tamil. You know, he says he, he was taken up to heaven. And he was taken up to a conference room in heaven. And he saw the father seated. And uh, of course, he's, he's um, garnishing it in a nice way. He's saying, oh, nobody can see the father. And next to the father was Jesus. So I, then I gathered that the person who was next to Jesus was the father. He was like a cloud and everything. And then I saw Moses, Elijah, and Sadhu Sundar Singh and everybody. 
and uh, I was so afraid. I was there waiting, and a hand came from the the cloud, the father, and the father's hand signaled me to come. So I tremblingly went forward, and that hand took a, 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 a beta cassette that was on the table in in heaven. There's a conference room, and there was a table, and on that a beta cassette that you use in uh, television studios, and the father took it and he looked at it and gave it to Jesus. And Jesus took that and told this guy, hey, your programs are wonderful. Uh, they're really good. Now, uh, but, but, but uh, you need to really improve. You need to uh, do a better job. You need to produce at least like uh, uh, the Hollywood. Better than Hollywood would be wonderful, but at least to the level of Hollywood. Now, this is my dear friends. I would uh, dare call this blasphemy and sacrilege because the Bible says nobody has ascended to heaven. Nobody has seen the Father. And this guy is making a comedy of things, my dear friends. And if you are a Tamil who is watching my program, I have no fear in using the name of that television, Angel TV, coming from India. Stop watching it. It's a load of garbage. Garbage and rubbish. False prophecy completely out of scripture, okay? And uh, I'm gutty enough to face anybody who want to confront me about uh, Angel TV, I'll tell you. But that's one of many, so many television programs, even some good television stations, you know, without uh, analyzing, without experimenting, the fellows, they just take on board some people who then come and talk uh, absolute garbage and uh, just uh, make money and fame impress people and uh, go and we need to wait against the the bible because jesus is com jesus is uh, admonishing now you can write what i am talking about under counsel the column counsel he's saying hold on to what you have the word hold on to the word my dear brother and sister if you have perturbance over this issue of prophecy if you don't know how to clarify between the, the the real prophecy and the false prophecy get yourself into a decent church a good recognized pastor a shepherd okay and then uh, hold on to the word of god hold on to the word of god and uh, that's enough if you hold on to the word of God, my dear friends, you don't need these soothsayers. You don't, look, I'm all for spiritual gifts because I'm a Pentecostal charismatic pastor. And I thank God for the many gifts that he, have given, he has given me also. <clears throat> but I'm scared, I'm very scared, I'm very careful. And usually when the Lord speaks to me, uh, when he gives me words of knowledge, I blend them into my examples and uh, my comedies. Uh, I don't uh, utter as prophecies because then, then, then people will come uh, behind me uh, as, a, uh, as if they are coming to a soothsay. I don't want that. Let all glory go to God and His word. And if you are somebody who is actually uh, perturbed over things pertaining to prophecy and uh, word of knowledge, just hold on to the Bible, my friends. If you hold on to the Bible and the word, everything is there in the word. Every word of knowledge, every word of wisdom, every prophecy is there in the Bible. This is the norm. This is the premise on which we stand. Uh, Bible, Bible, Bible. You need to be in a Bible-believing church. You need to be in a Bible-preaching church. You need to be under a pastor who teaches the Bible. And uh, at least if he can't, he, a person who is able to bring good teachers to teach you without running behind anointing, running behind a, a revival, running behind prophecies. Right? They're all good, but they're not healthy. They could be dangerous. Okay, And uh, he says, unto the rest in Theatira, uh, as many as uh, have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan. That's another joke. You see, today the, the trend is, my dear friends, in this 21st century, is uh, when somebody comes and says, uh, well, I know the depths of Satan, they are deep satanic secrets. I remember telling this in one of my foregone uh, segments that I have done uh, uh, demonology three years. I segregated, uh, segregated three of my learning years to study demonology and stay satanology, in which I had to study the black book of Solomon, 
and uh, I was very much um, researching about Anton Lave, who started the Satanic Church. The fellow died a long time ago, but the Church of Sta Satan is very powerful in uh, Los Angeles that he started and then it's growing and Satanism, Demonism, okay, uh, Freemasonry and uh, many, many other forms of uh, demonic stuff and of course Jezebelology, Babylonology and uh, it, it's very interesting, it's very interesting. Uh, some of you who may be watching this program may be very interested in uh, watching horror movies. Right. When I was very much into studying Satanology, I was so attracted to horror movies. So I used to watch um, <coughs> The Exorcist, uh, The Nightmare on Elm Street, The Omen, and all these movies uh, many times, many times, because they were so intriguing. And uh, <coughs> I would visit uh, these uh, places, Masonic temples and uh, many other Satanic uh, places. And I had books, boy, I'll tell you. Uh, and uh, But uh, it's a very dangerous thing. A couple who f studied the same stuff that I studied, eventually became, became uh, sorry for Satan. And then later on they joined the, the Church of Satan and became Satanists. A pastor and his wife, by the way. That's how dangerous it could be. People could just uh, be corrupt, you know, because Satan always plays an unfair game. He's not a decent fighter. And he can deceive people to believe that he's after all innocent and good and stuff like that. So my dear friends, be careful with people who come to you and say, I know the secrets of Satan. I know the, the, the witchcraft. Uh, I, know, uh, I, can, I know how to deal with uh, demons. Uh, and then be careful with people who associate every problem of your life with demons. You know, If you have an illness, okay, there may be a spirit of that illness mm, and uh, stuff like that. Be careful, these Satan's secrets, deep secrets, we don't need them. We know whoever he is, Satan is a defeated foe. Our Lord Jesus Christ crushed his head. We don't need to worry about his secrets. Let him have any secrets. Let him have any power. Let him use any weapon against us. Because the Bible says the, the weapons that are formed against you will not survive. Okay? Because we have the weapon, the name of Jesus Christ. We have another weapon, the blood of Jesus Christ. We have an offensive weapon, the double-edged sword. What more do we need? Do we don't need to be scared. We don't need to be perturbed. We don't, we don't need to be worried, my dear friends. Just stop worrying about this Satan's secret. And Jesus is condemning those who talk about the depths of Satan as this being. Okay, Jesus says, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now this is both historical and eschatological. Because he is telling that if you hold on to the word of God, and if you overcome, if you, if you come out of this Jezebelian thinking, and if you come out, come out of these unnecessary uh, elements that are anti-biblical, then you will have the word. And if you are a person of the word, you will rule the nations. My dear friends, sh shall I tell you about my experience now, you, if you don't know how, how, what it means to rule the nation. Because many people think that ruling the nation involves sitting on a chair, perhaps with Jesus next to you, and having a rod or something, and uh, ruling nations, right? as in an uh, emperor type. Not necessarily. Now look, I'm a very normal village boy from Sri Lanka in a place called Sudhumpala. I didn't know English. I didn't know Sinhala. I, I knew only my mother tongue. And I haven't done my A-levels. Today I have three PhDs and blah, blah, blah. But I haven't done my A-levels. God, I don't know. I praise God for the pastors who God gave me. My first pastor, Pastor Bosco Gunawardana, who baptized me, who preached the gospel to me in 1979. 
I praise God for Pastor Malcolm Gunawardana who taught me the word, who trained me in ministry. And I praise God for Pastor uh, Dr. Colton Vikramaratna who was my principal when I studied at the Assemblies of God Bible College. And when I studied at the Assemblies of God Bible College for three years, my dear friends, I'm not Assemblies of God. I was never in the Assemblies of God. But the three years that I studied at the Assemblies of God, the foundation, the word that, that they put in me made me a word man. I'm very much into the word, although I'm a Pentecostal charismatic who believes and operates in speaking in tongues, prophecies, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, healing, etc., etc. Okay, I'm a word man. Word, word is what I primarily teach, I want. And Jesus has done that in my life, my dear friends. Today, through my teachings, there are so many hundreds of thousands of people, literally, Tamils, Sinhalese, and people who speak other languages, who watch my programs in English, they, they consider me as their Bible teacher and they just follow what I teach them. And that's in a way ruling, aren't you? Not in a wrong kind of ruling, but people are there who call me from all over the world asking me, Pastor, how should I, what should I do? For example, somebody called me not too long ago and uh, wrote to me, by the way, by the way, saying, uh, I, I need to find a church. And, and after knowing where the person is, I, I directed that person to go to a particular church. There are so many people who follow my instructions as to which church to go, how to read the Bible, how to come into ministry and what sort of ministry to do. There are hundreds of churches, literally, that uh, treat me as their uh, pastor. I haven't seen them, but, but by watching my programs and contacting me, they are following. I am in directly in an abstract way ruling the nations. And that's part of what he's saying, my dear friends. If you are a word person, then you will be able to rule people who you even have not seen. Many nations that you even have never gone. Okay, do you see what I mean? What Jesus said was not only historical, it's eschatological, it's historical because it's happening now. Not all, I'm just giving you as an example. I'm not here to brag about me. Let all glory go to God. Who am I to brag about myself? Who am I for people to ask questions from me as to what they should do? It's the word in me, my dear friends. The word. And then eschatological. Yes, during the millennium of Christ, there will be some people, some Christians. Now let me talk about the millennium when we come to that in the later chapters. But there will be people who would physically reign with Jesus because Jesus says he will sit with me and reign with me. Yes, today we are in that situation because in Revelation 1 we saw that Jesus has taken us to sit with him and rule. That we are doing in a spiritual sense, but, that, but eventually... During the millennial reign of Christ, people will definitely do it physically with Jesus. They'll be there ruling with Jesus. So it's both historical and eschatological. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> uh, verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. So he's comparing how he rules. Remember when he was on this earth, the three years that he spent teaching, preaching, performing miracles, signs and wonders and healing, he was preaching the kingdom of God, but at times he was very vituperative, wasn't he? When he addressed issues with the Pharisees, Sadducees and uh, scribes, he was very vituperative. He told them off. He was very strong. At one point, he called Herod the fox. Okay. And Jesus is saying, okay, you will be like me and you will rule with an iron rod. Okay. And uh, of course, the iron does not have to mean smiting, spanking, but also the strength. The iron talks about the strength. Many people want to very comfortably translate this as a very harsh rule, iron rod, the scepter. 
but uh, the scepter, the iron rod actually is a metaphorical term for a strong scepter and the scepter does not necessarily mean uh, a very punishing type of rule, heavy ruling, heavy shepherding, but it means authority, authoritative. In other words, in an abstract way, Jesus is saying, I will give my authority to you. You will have the same authority as mine when you rule these nations. Because my authority was given to me by my father. Now, who is talking here? The son of God, right? We saw that earlier. My father gave me the right and now I am giving you the rights. And I will give him the morning star. The morning star, the Latin expression for morning star is Lucifer. So don't think that the Lord is going to give you Lucifer. No, the morning star is actually Mercury, the, the planet Mercury. When we see that, it comes in the morning and it sort of brightens things up. And uh, sometimes Jesus is also called the morning star. And Lucifer was called the morning star before he fell, okay? Satan is not the morning star anymore. He was an angel. When he was an angel, he was a morning star. Uh, Isaiah 14 says that. And the morning star is livening things up, brightening things up. So you will be somebody who would, uh, by your presence, brighten things up. If you hold on to uh, the word of God, you will bright everywhere you go. If you have the word of God, you, 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 you may not be a preacher, you may be an average believer. But even as a believer, if you are a word person, without running behind all these expressions and emotions, right? There is a lot of emotionalism bound these days. But if you are a word person, you will keep on lightening things up, right? Now, if you, if you, if you are with somebody who is always prophesying, always talking about uh, word of knowledge, uh, I don't know about you, my dear friends, but I feel allergic to be around those people because I see them hyper-spiritual. They're not normal. And I don't believe Christianity is uh, anything abnormal, supranormal. Christianity is a normal life. You need to talk to people. You need to laugh. You need to smile. You need to enjoy. You need to just be friendly. You need to have crack jokes. You need to live a normal life. When we live a normal wife, <laughs> normal life with a normal wife, <coughs> we need to uh, just uh, know that we are Christians. Let the Lord also be with us in our conversations and in our uh, nice uh, fellowship. If you are hyper spiritual, my goodness, some people I always see them as you know, always talking about, uh, oh, glory, hallelujah, all the time. They are just levitating. I don't want to be around these people because I feel hugely uncomfortable. I feel like I am, I'm not even saved sometimes being around with some people. And would you, would you like me to come to you and all the time talking about something, you know, okay, there's a spirit in this house, you need to be careful. I dreamt a dream last night about you. God is, yes, it's okay for a few minutes, but then you would be bored. We need to have a normal life and uh, to, to sit and rule with Jesus and, uh, and to brighten things up. So if you are a normal person of the word, wherever you go, you will brighten that place up. You would lighten that place up, okay? And that's what he's talking about here. And he's saying, uh, but as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers sometimes, uh, the authority involves Judgment, you know, God has given us authority to judge the angels, not the good ones, but the ones that are fallen. So Jesus is eschatologically mentioning that uh, the, the, the way we are going to judge those angels and in Pauline theology as well, Paul also talks about that in Thessalonians. And uh, we have the right to judge the world, judge the nations, judge those fallen angels, and judge those who did not accept Jesus. Yo, we will be, we will be with Jesus when He judges. So that that is also mentioned here, right? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, this is to the churches. On that note, I would want to talk about the history, my dear friends. So if you go to the column of uh, the historical era, you would write that it is from 609 AD to uh, 1520 AD and I have just written the dates uh, in my little book 
uh, and I will just follow the dates and I will explain what happened in those years. Okay, in 609, uh, uh, the first uh, pope was appointed. Although, although eventually, right from Peter to today's Pope Francis, the popes were all called popes. Okay, but nobody was called a pope till 609 BC when uh, the church father in Rome, Boniface III, called himself the Pope, the father, Papaya, okay, in Latin, the father, the English variant is uh, Pope in 609 uh, AD. Now my dear friends, for that, don't know from where, but they were able to obtain some Babylonian priests, okay, the Babylonian religion exists even today in a very, very secret way. They are much more secret than the Freemasons. They are much more secret than the secret societies. The Babylonian religion still exists as the Babylonian religion, although it has permeated into other religions as well. Okay. Now, somehow the Pope was able to get these uh, Babylonian priests who are worshipping Gilgamesh, Semiramis, Tammuz, okay, and uh, ordain him as well. And they were the ones who gave the name Pontifus, Pontiff, to the uh, Pope. The term Pontiff was originally given to the Babylonian priest in uh, Babel, in Mesopotamia, to Gilgamesh. Okay, and uh, Gilgamesh's uh, priests were called Pontiffs, and uh, therefore the the Pope, the title Pontiff, is a Babylonian expression okay how 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 would uh, jesus have felt when that happened to the church <laughs> now <coughs> jesus is no longer the head of the church a man and that man is uh, called the pontiff and the babylonian priests come and uh, ordain him can you see the jezebelian spirit very active there and uh, then uh, a few decades later in 700 uh, ad uh, when the Dome of the Rock was built in Jerusalem by the Muslims, the Pope's feet were kissed by people. Kissing of Pope's foot happened. And in 786 AD, worshipping of images and relics were sanctified. Now many Catholics don't know that it is official to worship the images and relics that you see in your church. If you are a Catholic, uh, and if you say, no, 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 I don't worship them, I just look at them, then by looking at them I get the, the ability to concentrate. Now that's many of the, that's what the, that's what many of the Catholics say. When they look at these statues and pictures, they're able to concentrate on prayer rather than worshipping those images. But my dear friends, from 786 AD, the Catholic Church uh, has lawfully permitted people to worship images and relics. 850, 850 AD, they began to use holy water. 890, they began to worship Joseph. Up until 890, Joseph was considered a saint, but they began to worship him like the way they worship Mary from 890. 995, uh, the canonization of den dead saints. I'll explain that. My dear friends, the word of God is the Bible. But uh, in uh, 995 uh, AD, the dead saints, whoever was made a saint by the Catholic Church, was began to be venerated as a deity. Hmm? You could worship him. And uh, whatever he or she has said is equivalent to the word of God. Very dangerous. Imagine the word of God was actually Jesus, is Jesus, will always be Jesus. And the expressed word of God, the Logos, which has become Rema to us, uh, is uh, again Jesus. And now there is something uh, similar to the word of God. The, the Whatever the dead saints have said are treated as the word of God. And uh, that's quite similar to Mormonism, right? Now, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormon, claimed that uh, an angel called Moroni came and revealed uh, to him about these golden plates on which the word of God had been written. And then he got the gift of translating 
and he translated it apparently and brought forth a book called the Book of Mormons. And the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints today treats the Book of Mormon as a sequel to the Bible. It's another Bible. That's also an inspired word of God for them. Now that's wrong because the, the only word of God for mankind uh, then and now and forever is the, the, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, And uh, if we say Joseph Smith and his Mormons are wrong, then long before Mormonism sprang out, the, the Catholic Church did a similar thing and uh, they said that everything what the dead saints have said are quite equivalent to the word of God and they are canonical. Strange. Then fasting on Fridays and Lent days began in 998 AD. Up until then, uh, the Lent days were not celebrated. Now many Catholics don't know that. Many Catholics believe that ever since Jesus died and rose again, the Christians are following the Lent days. They are not, uh, they don't eat meat, they don't have uh, marriages and uh, ceremonies uh, 40 days uh, prior to the uh, Good Friday. And it started only in 998 AD, my dear friends. And it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite unreasonable because, yes, of course, Jesus suffered from tumultuous death, but his death brought us life. And Jesus did not die and perish. He rose again from the dead. So his dead, death is a, a victory to us because through his death, he destroyed the power of Satan completely. And... Uh, if at all we are to enjoy uh, happily and celebrate, I would, I believe it should be the 40 days before Good Friday. Uh, but that was when they, they don't uh, eat meat, they fast and, and uh, they don't celebrate, they don't have good functions. And also on all Fridays, because Friday happened to be the day on which the Lord was crucified. And that happened only, started to happen only in 998 AD. When people began to question the Pope, uh, because some of the stuff that the Pope said and did were quite unbiblical, there were people, there were the there was the remnant who always were uh, quite out, outspoken and then they questioned uh, some of those stuff and therefore in 1070 AD the Pope was declared infallible. Oh my God! Hey, after all, the Pope is a man. How can he be infallible? But according to the Catholic Church from 1070 to now, the Pope is infallible. I have a question in 1996, I think. Was it 1996? I, I, I think so, okay? Uh, I have to check it out, but I think I have a good... Because that's the year when Sri Lanka won uh, the World Cup cricket and we got the cup. I was in England. And yes, yes, it was in 1996 when Pope John Paul uh, asked public forgiveness for the papal errors of the past, nullifying this theory that for the popes were infallible. I mean, if they were infallible, why would Pope John Paul II ask forgiveness from the general Catholic populace for the fallibilities of, the, of his predecessors? So, uh, anyway, that's just to deviate from what I'm talking about. Anyway, the, the, the Catholic Church is to believe that the Pope is always infallible. And today, my dear friends, this Jesuit, uh, the Pope that we have today in the world, Pope uh, Francis, oh boy, he's talking, he's talking about a lot of stuff. He's condoning homosexuality in an abstract manner, and uh, he's... Uh, Oh boy, and, and the Catholics are now a little bit uh, perturbed over the issue of uh, his infallibility because they are saying, okay, a Pope, uh, he's talking stuff that uh, uh, no Pope uh, ever spoke, or spoke about. Anyway, I'll leave that uh, to the Catholics. Let's go to 1079 when celibacy of priesthood was uh, implemented. Priests up until at that time got married, but then... Uh, pay, uh, priests were not supposed to be married. But if you read uh, the first, uh, the, the, the epistles of Paul to Timothy and to Titus, you'll see that even the, the elder, the shepherd, uh, would have to have one wife, uh, husband of a wife. 
but here we are talking about celibacy. In 1090, prayer beads began to be used. Hey, you know what? Have you seen Muslims using prayer beads? They use uh, the prayer beads like the rosary to chant uh, their things. Muslims? Muslims started it much earlier than the Catholics, okay? I don't know whether the Catholics copied it from the Muslims. I don't know that. But anyway, the prayer beads, uh, because I, I did I did a lot of research to find out how in the world did the Catholics get this idea from and I couldn't find. And uh, 1090, uh, they started using the prayer beads. And in 1184, they started something very inhuman, the Inquisition. If anybody spoke or did anything against the Catholic Church, they were captured, arrested, punished and tortured and killed, <coughs> massacred inquisition. Oh boy, you know, if you look at some machines of malice in the, the National Geographic channel, uh, some of the, most of those machines were used for the inquisition. And uh, I, I personally visited some of these countries where they still uh, retain these machines of malice that they used uh, in uh, during the period of uh, periods of inquisition and i saw i saw a, a, a huge statue of mary a beautiful statue and when you open it it's full of nails so if anybody spoke bad about mary the person would be coffined alive inside he'll be fixed to the 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 opened coffin type thing of mary and then they will close and when they close the nails pierce the body and and the person is crushed and the blood flows uh, through it, it, it the blood flows through the statue and it's drained away and uh, they, they wanted to make the people feel that Mary herself is crushing them and killing them oh boy and I saw a machine where they would tie uh, your two feet and your two hands and these machines would pull and pull and pull and then pull the person's limbs apart and uh, causing a very painful death and uh, oh boy I can talk about these machines for an hour and uh, there are so many machines of malice that the Catholic Church used against who spoke or did things uh, against the Roman Catholic Church, the Inquisition. And people were so afraid of the Inquisition. They did not want to get caught. And sometimes if they committed some mistakes, they wanted to ask forgiveness. And when they wanted to uh, ask forgiveness, they were charged, they were charged money. They were charged, huge fines were made. Then they quite comfortably uh, introduced uh, the sale of indulgence in 1190. You could pre-purchase uh, the tickets of forgiveness. They're called indulgences. Where you can buy and keep them and if you commit a mistake against the church, then when you are fined, you can pay this. You can buy in advance. Which was also one of the things that uh, irritated Martin Luther late in his life. We will talk about that when we talk about the next church. Then in 1225, the doctrine of transubstantiation confirmed and confessing to the priest happened. You know, confessing your sins to the priest started only in 1225, okay? Don't think that the Roman Catholic Church has been practicing this practice ever since its inception. No, 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 no. Only in 1215, they started to confess to the priest. And then uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation. Do you know what that is? When the communion is taken, they believe that the bread truly becomes the body of Christ and the wine truly becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. So you are actually chewing the body of Christ. Now the, the real Holy Communion, the Eucharist is God has made us uh, so be able to participate in the death of Jesus by taking that, whatever, the bread. The bread doesn't become the body, okay? The body has become the bread. It's like that, 
It's a symbol, it's a sign. It's an emblem. The wine is an emblem. But they believed that it's truly the body and the blood of Jesus. And uh, that was 1215, my dear friends. And uh, because of that in 1226, the adoration of water was confirmed. Okay, uh, Not the wafer, wafers. Many people call it a wafer, the bread. Because it's real body and blood of Jesus, they venerate it. It's true body and true blood of Jesus. But that's not, that's not right biblically. Now do you see how the church had swayed historically? And do you think that the Lord Jesus would be happy to see what's happening to the church between the period of uh, 609 BC and 1220? No. Very sad. And uh, today also, my dear friends, all these doctrines may be in our churches. Okay, friends, we are done with the church in Theatira, and uh, whereby we have come to the end of chapter 2. And it has taken a long time, hasn't it? And um, I have spoken a lot. And you may have observed that I am talking very casually with you, my dear friends. And I don't want to make this very official because these segments are sometimes long. And if you are to sit and listen to these, taking notes, you can't just do these in one sitting. Although I do all these recordings in one sitting, one segment per one sitting. Except for the one in Pergamos. Remember, I had that problem and then I came 24 hours later. So the, 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 the talk about uh, Pergamum took two days for me. But all the others, I sit and I start and finish uh, with each segment. And uh, when, when you study, please keep me in your prayers also because uh, I need a lot of wisdom, I need a lot of anointing and I need a lot of clarity in my speech to make you understand because some of you are from America. Some of the terminologies that, uh, that I use may be very foreign to you and some of you who are from England, or from South Africa, from Australia, you have your own accent. And uh, if you think that uh, Suresh is talking with an accent, I'm sorry my dear friends, I'm not talking with an accent because Sri Lanka was a colony of England and I speak English that English people spoke those days and you are listening with an accent. <laughs> okay? So just we'll have uh, fun studying the book of Revelation and uh, keep me in your prayers as I pray for you. Yes, we a lot of us are praying for those of you who are watching these programs and mind you, I'll tell you, Hundreds and thousands of people are watching this program, my dear friends. And I believe that I, I am a blessing to you uh, because the book of Revelation is a blessing. It's a tremendous joy for me to have been chosen by God to teach the book of Revelation to you. And uh, I'm very humbled by this uh, ministry that he has given me. Write to us and uh, keep us in your prayers. Email us, uh, send a text to us and all our details are always there on the screen. Keep in touch and uh, just be with us as we together study the book of Revelation. And also, hey, if you have any suggestion, if you, have, if you know something that I don't know, teach me. Let me know if you, if you know something that I don't know. Please, please, I always want to know. I don't want to be dogmatic. And if you disagree with certain things that I say, just write to me. Don't be harsh. Don't scold me. Don't tell me off. Just tell me, hey, Suresh, I don't think this is right. Do a little bit of uh, more... Uh, study and see, uh, you know, I'm not perfect, am I? And you can never finish studying the book of Revelation. And uh, we have come to the end of chapter 2. And uh, in the next segment, we will go to chapter 3. There are three churches that we are going to discuss from our next uh, segment. And here is my book uh, 3 on that. And again, I remind you, if you want my books, I'm not selling them. But, but you're welcome to give an offering if you like. But uh, you can write to us and uh, these are now typed because we don't have the, the, the uh, written ones anymore. So we are typing it again and we will produce it. And we will talk about the three churches in Revelation 3, the boring, benevolent and the badly behaved churches. Okay. God bless you, my dear friends. Jesus of Revelation be with you and bless you and see you in our next segment. Amen.